thank you for our, to our presenters. Um, we now proceed to our Q&A portion and I invite uh, all the participants, the attendees and the panelists to please either type your questions mm -hmm. in the Q&A box or in the chat box, or just raise your hands if you want to deliver it or deliver the question yourself if you are able to turn on your microphone or your camera. But before that, I have a couple of questions here already. Before I, I pass the, it over to them, let me just ask uh, uh, you know, a simple, a basic question now. How are the musicians doing now at this time uh, of crisis, of political crisis in Myanmar? Okay, anybody can answer my question. Okay, so thank you very much, Doctor. That was th that is the, the question that I expected. <laughs> Actually, the musician life uh, itself is very difficult in in Myanmar. Before uh, after Kuping, uh, it is totally stop our uh, our walking, teaching, and and production, and so very difficult. So <laughs> many, many musicians become, um, they, they, they stop their, their jobs and also some become vendors and some becomes a taxi driver. And so they, they are working for a living, for their living, especially for the, uh, the traditional musician, they are very, very difficult because uh, they are not uh, good income uh, before still. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the others in the panel might want to add. Well, I'd, I'd just like to say that um, the, and I said that in, in the video too, just the importance of the internet in connection with uh, lack of work and um, losing students and then uh, people being so depressed they can't play. But then there's another aspect of people being uh, encouraged and inspired, and they create an amazing uh, repertoire of songs on on the, uh, all over Facebook, um, and that's a way to to create unity and you know sort of thinking forward rather than backward in this crisis. Thank you, uh, Nimio. You might want to add anything. Yeah, uh, as Samakit uh, and Nimuntuan mentioned. So many musicians, traditional musicians, they having uh, having any problem because they have to depend on religious ceremony because of the COVID, because of the military coup. There is no you know, ceremony, nothing. But you know, the good thing out of those you know, problems is that the, the traditional musician, especially the elderly musician, you know, they got more time. You know, usually they they will go out and you know, perform you know, in their life. But right now they have more time, plenty of time, so they have a chance to teach. The next generation, like someone, uh, one of my colleagues, Kiri Mamon, the traditional musician. So he got some student actually uh, near his neighborhood and he shared his knowledge. In normal situation, I don't think he will have time to teach like that. So that is a good thing out of uh, the terrible situation. Thank you. Thank you. And, it, and it's, it's really nice to have you all join here with us now. Uh, I'd like to invite now Dr. Janus Baez to turn on his mic and ask this question. Uh, he has for, for Kit. Jonas? Hello. Uh, my question actually is not only for Kit, but it's for everybody. First and foremost, I am a confessed fan of music from Burma, most especially the Sandayao, which fascinates me even to this day. And my students have been fed with this as much as I can. I've fed them with this fascinating development. Um, my question is, uh, how do you think is music and its pedagogy, a form of resistance to the present uh, social order, to the present social situation. Can, can we see it as a form of resistance? Um, I'll, I'll tackle it a little bit and then, yeah, Nemo and Tonton have um, great ideas too. Um, I'm interested in, in how pop music has become that form of re resistance like okay. in this year particularly. Um, as for in traditional music, uh, the in the past, the um, dictatorship has appropriated a lot of traditional forms for yes. um, uh, performances and events. Um, so is it 
you know, the question is, I, I think as music gets transmitted to younger people who um, embody whatever meaning for them it is, uh, there are, you know, syncretic ways of using traditional Burmese music and instruments in more modern forms yes. that um, is a resistance to something like what is there, there, uh, there is a, a real a society of musicians who, um, who the music association says this is possible and that's not possible and what so and so is doing over here um, is is counterproductive and not really representing the tradition. So you know you have have those those questions are always happening. Um, what's conservative? What's liberal? What's expansive? Um, what's contained? And um, in these circumstances this year, I think I think the all sort of all stops are pulled out. So answering a question like that is really tough, but thanks, Jonas. Would anybody want to add to Jonas's question? Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm so fascinated with uh, Dr. Nemio Ong's uh, last statement of collect, imitate and create, because I know that in the Philippine context, we could use those terms to apply to how we we went into the revolution, the Philippine revolution. And in fact, the notion of nationhood because we collected knowledge from Europe. We imitated some of their notions and we created our own notion. And I think, uh, uh, do you think music is such a potential uh, or, or is it already happening? For me, yeah, I, I think it is happening uh, to some extent and because uh, Another way is like here in Burmese people, you know, including me, you know, I used to think you know, music is for just for fun and for entertainment. Yes. So still now, you know, many people's idea of music is just an entertainment. So, so situation like right now, so many people think you know, it's you know, difficult to express this situation with music. So mo most people think music is just for you know, happiness, for entertainment. So yes. in this kind of situation, people are suffering, you know, like, so they think it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's not appropriate you know, to play music in an enjoy environment, the country is struggling. So because most people have that kind of concept, it's very difficult for you know, musicians like us, you know, like to perform and to, to do some music. And also traditionally, you know, like traditional musicians, they mostly, you know, the context of the traditional music is mostly stick to religious ceremony, and also the, the royal court about the king, the forest. Yes. So to set you know, like modern uh, uh, contacts or you know, some kinds of political things on traditional music is kind of new for you know, most people. So I myself, you know, when I was uh, in this situation, I thought, what should I do? You know, I cannot uh, uh, take them and I cannot do anything. But I'm just saying, so I should do something with music. But the problem is I cannot think of anything you know, to make political music with the traditional music. Yes. It's always just encouraging me just to go to Kobe last time, you know, more like a hip hop, you know, you just, you can criticize all kinds of things in it, you know, instead of mm -hmm. doing it in traditional style. You know. But, yes. you know, there's many people who are using you know, traditional music you know, as a tool uh, to express uh, their political point of view and their ideas. That, that's fascinating. Situation. That's fancy. And even, and perhaps even connecting with the, the outside, with, with the, with the larger community, uh, the APSE, for example, that might be a form of resistance to be part of the APSE. Uh, I'm talking of how civil society can, in fact, empower itself. If 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 states are, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you ideas, but uh, I'm just talking how civil society can empower itself if states are oppressive. Uh, so even connecting with with institutions or with with uh, organizations outside. The country, like APSE, for example, where we can discuss, we can talk, we can open up, we can connect with people. I think that can be a very significant form of resistance. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to have attended your talks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. There's a question from Dr. Sui Beng Tan. Uh, it's been already, already partly addressed, but uh, Sui Beng, you might want to ask your question anyway. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, it's so nice to see all of you all very here and so well and very positive about everything. Uh, I, th I think you've already answered some of my questions, but actually I wanted to know more about Gitamet. Like how, ha how have you all, you know, the musicians there, 
how have y'all adapted to the pandemic and to the coup in you know in in the ways of teaching the traditions are, are you all still continuing and how are you doing it yeah i think it'd be very nice if you could share some of your experiences with us yes thank you very much for your question uh, actually we started uh, our online teaching since in 2020 uh, in the mid of 2020 um, uh, after pandemic uh, when we uh, the the country was um, announced to stop all the the school uh, on the april end of march so we all started to our uh, online teaching for six months uh, later the um, the coup uh, happened and so our teaching uh, was totally stopped for about two, three months. And because all of our teachers and our students are in the revolution, um, so we, we stopped our, our teaching for a while. And now we restart our online teaching uh, as much as we can. And also, <clears throat> uh, 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 like me, uh, now I'm very far away from Yangon, the, the city, uh, Mogo is um, it's a small town. And uh, in, in my uh, neighborhood, I, I'm teaching my music uh, to the children and the youth uh, as much as I can. And also I'm teaching online. So even though the online is not too good, and, and like me, uh, two days ago, the, there is a big exploring uh, to our electric office and our electricity was down and now I'm using with a machine and, and so, so on. So we are struggling like this as much as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, question and answer. Dr. Rick Tremelius has a question. I don't know, Rick, can you, are you able to turn on your microphone and ask the question over the mic? Uh, the, I, well, the, hi, yeah, the question is very clear. I was just um, wondering, uh, if both of the Sendai players come from a family lineage of artists, and so that you are, your experience is somewhat different from the, the uh, uh, usual experience, or are, are there many players that also don't come from musical families? Thank you. So mostly, you know, most musicians, they come from the musical uh, background, musical family, like you know, their parents might play some instrument, so they might they will play you know, sandia or any other instrument. Uh, but, you know, they, they even, they have a term they call, like, uh, in Burmese, jetta. It's more like, you know, lay people who, who is outside of the musical community. So they refer like that. So it's, and also the most traditional musician I encounter, they believe, you know, if you are you know, like outside of the community, it's almost impossible to become a musician. So, because I, I can understand, it's not like, you know, looking down, or it's not like, you know, discriminating. It's more like, you know, the ear culture, you know. If you are grew up outside of the music community, it's very difficult for you to get enough, you know, sonnet experience like the one who grew up in that community. Thank you. Okay, this answer your question. Thank you, thank you, Nimio. Um, Dr. Santos has a question. Are you able to turn on your microphone, Dr. Santos? No, I, I don't have any questions. Uh, actually, my question has already been answered by Kit. Mm. But uh, anyway, um, uh, you know, I've been fascinated by the Sandaya. It's a fantastic, fantastic music. Uh, and um, it's good that uh, you are continuing with the, with the tradition. Uh, is there a problem with uh, getting pianos, for example, or getting instruments for the young, you know? So I suppose uh, my question is uh, directed to Dr. Nomi <laughs> Nemio or D Dr. Kit Young. There are a lot of electric keyboards and electric pianos now oh, that, see. so in a sense, yeah, it's flooded. Yeah, yeah. Keyboards okay. flood as opposed <laughs> to the old days. But, but that has its um, drawbacks. So Nimio, I don't know, maybe you can talk about that. You know, the no acoustic, uh, the old uh, Burmese upright piano in, in Burma and, and being yeah. able to feel an acoustic 
you know, sound makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. right. And with acoustic sound and also the tuning system has changed. But you know, uh, one good thing is you know, having those in uh, electronic piano, uh, we are still lucky you know, because according to our experience, many great you know, uh, Sunday art player, even though they are very famous, they do not have you know, uh, real acoustic piano or electric piano. So they have to, mostly they have to use a uh, bamboo xylophone to practice and later they will go to the studio and practice in real piano. So compared to uh, um, the old, the old day, uh, we are lucky having those electronic piano. Yeah, anyway, uh, my other question was uh, already asked of Kit Young. Uh, can you compose new pieces for the Sandaya? Or uh, is it purely taught orally? Or can you notate it? Or can you can you create new ways of teaching the, the Sandaya? So Ramon, that's, that's so fascinating and so um, multi-dimensional, as you know. Um, the question of notation for a whole culture of, of you know, an oral, an oral position in time that's not a 16th note or a 32nd and doesn't, doesn't reflect the relationship to time markers that are not necessarily on the, the, not translatable on the page is one that, you know, we look at that all over the world. Um, I think to, to, to answer your question, or at least to address the first part of it, which is, can you compose new music for in Sanya style? Absolutely. Yes, and, and when Nemo spoke to different traditions and different masters having this particular style of bringing in different languages to certain patterns that are recognizable as traditional <coughs> Burmese music in rhythmic um, and tempo variations that people say, oh yes, you know, yes, that's, that's classically Burmese, but there's also a flavor of so many possibilities that go with that. And so that's what makes the lesson, yeah, the uh, cadenza light playing um, so fascinating because somebody, a musician will craft um, an arrangement of a tune or bring in a new tune um, with patterns that are recognizable as, as something classical. So it's, yeah, it's ever unfolding. Thank you. Let me read this Thank question you. sent over by Dulce Punsalan. Uh, I guess anybody in the panel can answer this. It's over at the Q&A box if you want to look at it. What are the emerging themes of new composition by the young people in Myanmar? And which digital platforms are they using to get their songs to the target audience? Uh, yes. Now, before the coup, many young pop musician, they make uh, they use the digital platform uh, of YouTube and some other local digital platform too. And also uh, now they change a bit uh, their idea, musical themes uh, for one year after grouping. So we didn't see any uh, pops music uh, uh, with different themes. Uh, just many revolution songs uh, at the present. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this one is from Motohide Taguchi, also from the Q&A box, uh, addressed to Nimio. Besides recording of the Sandaya performances by various famous masters, are there piano scores which notate exactly what they play? That's partly already asked by Dr. Santos. And number two, in case of local towns having local style of the Sandaya performance, are there any cases as follows? The recordings by the famous masters living in the capital and having access with recording company may give the great influences to local musicians and it may vanish the local style. So in other words, the influence of of the producers. I have to reiterate uh, 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 some of So there's uh, many people who are trying to transcribe, you know, the, uh, trying to preserve Sandia music into Western stuff notation. So we do have a lot of book, uh, a lot of uh, piano uh, score. But at the same time, you know, like uh, she said, is uh, because of the different uh, diverse uh, musical cultural background. So Western uh, stuff notation is quite, you know, 
there are some you know problem you know, to notate know, balanced music in the sense of notation, especially uh, you know the what we call C and C C Nawa, Tiny and Bear and Pepper, the special you know me, me, something like a meter we use in balanced music instead of you know counting like one, two, three, four, like you know, the census side. So that, that would be a real problem. But uh, when uh, we compose a new music you know, for especially for a foreigner, so we we have no choice. That that's the step notation is the only you know, choice for us to use to deliver you know, what we want them to play. But uh, at the same time, you know, there's many problems like I said before you know, about the timing, about the nuances, uh, about the how to execute you know, all the step. Uh, for the second question, yeah, it's more it's not like a local style. It's more like you know like regional style. I, I have to say, so like you know about the Central region. And also the Delta region, the Lower Burma and the Upper Burma, and something like that. You know that each region have uh, their own you know, style and their own lineage. At the same time, depending on each, you know, the master. So yeah, we can also see like you know the, the, how like the Indian music, you know, the master and you know, student relationship like that. You know, it's handed down through the guru to the student. So yeah, especially like like you know the uh, U.S. You know, the musician from Yangon, you know, they have more privilege to record and their you know, improvisation or their music. So it's really influenced you know, the rest of the country uh, compared to some musicians who live in, in the remote area. I think uh, uh, Kit can relate, explain more about this. Um, I mean, Nemio, you've, re you've really covered it. I, it's just um, in terms of style and um, <laughs> Um, as the difference between a performing composer or a, you know, a performing composer and a composed piece is also a conceptual um, difference that, that I think as um, in the path of learning, let's say, in the path of being an outsider, having, having uh, learned from different teachers, um, it's, it's a combination of, we, we were talking earlier, one of the panels about embodiment, musical embodiment, and um, I think that is so much a part of the music making that uh, to reduce the, the, the music itself, the experience, the existential experience of, 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 of musicking um, requires that you, know, you, you, you are in this one language with this one person, with this one particular personal musical language. And um, I guess I'm reiterating what I said before about um, extending that language into one's own, one's own um, way of interpreting and then moving forward as an improviser um, slash composer. Yeah, punishing like you punishing is like like you said, you know, it's not even you know like uh, other remote area, even in Django, you know, the capital city, you know, people who follow different lineage, you know, uh, because of the government institution institution institutionalized you know, the situation is we now we only have uh, people only mostly know about the standardized version of Mahavita Bams classical music. So uh, is getting, you know, uh, some, you know, uh, lineage are you know, getting disappeared, vanishing, uh, because, you know, it's kind of like people think, you know, like I mentioned in my uh, presentation, uh, they think it is uh, the, standard, you know, the uh, standardized version is the only version and the correct way of playing. So people just follow, and also government institution is the only place, you know, mostly the famous place for people to go and attend. So they follow only that you know, lineage. So the other lineage and the other tradition in you know, local time are uh, getting punishments you know, given virtually. Well, and if I could say quickly, um, just speak to what happens in other countries as well. When the government uh, sets the curriculum, when the education ministry sets a curriculum and you have adults coming into music making, um, having not, been around uh, musicians or lineages or knowing the difference and the creative uh, genius capacity of various individuals, right, who, who um, express themselves, they're stuck with that system. And then the ear of the whole um, apparatus for students, for teachers, for the continuity, for the uh, conformity of the government prescribed curriculum goes out into into society at large and then you no longer have that expectation unless you meet a particularly gifted individual um, so you have this sort of 
standardized acceptance or standardized way of, of thinking of what sandhya or sangwaing or heart playing um, is. There's a follow-up question from Dulce uh, in the Q&A box. Um, thanks, Dr. Uh, Ney, for replying to my question. Are there revolution-themed songs uploaded in YouTube and other digital platforms not censored given the social political environment and having asked that me i, I want to know if are, are you all being monitored for being in an international uh forum like this are, are you free to answer uh honestly and and candidly about matters like this so dr ne <clears throat> yes actually uh now many uh, in Instagram and many, uh, many platform, many digital platform, we are using those kind of, they, they call donate to clips. Um, so they make many revolution songs uh, on the online and YouTube too. Um, and, and after they, if, they if, if the people want to donate to the, those kind of, uh, uh, revolution force um, we can see we can um, click to the those kind of uh, music and we can listen that song and it it, it uh, uh, directly donate donate to the um, those kind of uh, force uh, revolutionary force so I, I never heard about yes we have to be and uh, taking care uh, to make those kind of songs. Uh, uh, but uh, on the YouTube, we have no censorship uh, uh, so far. Thank you. Thank you. That's nice to hear. Are there any other questions from maybe our, our panelists from the other panel earlier would like to send our speakers a question? Um, something that Kit already also, also touched on, and I, I um, also heard uh, Professor Ney uh, refer to it earlier, not really a question, but <clears throat> a comment which you might want to respond to about the fact that there is no standardized curriculum or that there's no music in the general curriculum in, in Myanmar. And I compare that, for example, with an earlier panel uh, who are trying to grapple with existing curricula in the general education just to correct things that have been there for years and are not really uh, are not really uh, contributing to what is important. Uh, I know in the Philippines, for example, we we have a standardized curriculum being imposed by uh, administrators who know nothing about music, or who know nothing about what is important in music, and this all came into. Uh, into the, being exposed with, with the uh, online uh, remote learning that we have now because the, the platform uses modules and everybody has been criticizing all the mistakes that are in the modules. But uh, the point is I appreciate something, uh, an, an institution like an organization like Kitamite uh, who is um, independent and is able with all the difficulties to pursue its own, its own agenda, rather than trying to grapple with what the government imposes uh, in, 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 the, in the general curriculum. I don't know if you want to respond to that observation. Yes, uh, that's why we are running GitMate, uh, because um, in uh, the, uh, our, our, our country, there are um, many uh, uh, ethnic city and, and most of the ethnic city and hill tribes they are uh, not buddhism so the buddhism uh, they are very close to uh, our traditional music of sign wine and those kind of um, uh, sunday music but the christian christian community and most of the uh, countryside people they are they think that is not for them. So, so we just want to uh, encourage and, and also not, not where to, not sign and not music. Uh, they are very uh, far away from, they have not uh, uh, ideas on those kind of music. So we want to encourage them 
uh, so that's why we are making uh, Gidame Music Institute in, in Yangon. And in Gidame, we have many diverse uh, people and diverse uh, culture learning and sharing each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any more questions from, from the audience and, and from the panelists? Okay, this one is uh, from uh, Jocelyn. You, you want to uh, 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 ask the question yourself, if you can turn on your microphone, Dr. Guadalupe. Um, good evening to our panelists. I'd like to ask if the state has plans to appropriate music to pacify the population through, of course, using state music education, if there are. If none, then good for you. Now, my second question is, do children realize the possibility of using music to subvert the lack of freedom in your country? And uh, do they express this in, in the music that they make? Uh, Nimio, can you answer that? I, yeah, I think, you know, uh, they, they use, uh, the government use music you know, to pacify. In, in the old days, we have traditional, and you traditional music competition, so karaoke. So uh, in um, the, they, they usually you know, propagate like you know, to preserve traditional music, uh, to bring in you know, peace and united. Actually, they are trying to you know, cover it up, you know, what they have done. You know, so at the same time, you're know, trying to uh, put you know, traditional music above any other music and also using the music you know, just uh, to attract you know, more people you know, around uh, the country. So they, they, they really understand the meaning and the power of the music and they use music to pacify. Um, but uh, in which the current situation is quite difficult for them you know, to use uh, music as a means of uh, pacifying. Uh, thank you. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, do children express themselves, their views against government using music in a subverted way? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of censorship going on right now, but um, do, can they realize the potential for sending messages across? Because I remember in, in our own country, in the Philippines, there are rappers in Marawi. Since they cannot express themselves, uh, their, their feeling, totality, they rap about it. So sort of uh, tempers the message. Uh, I was curious if there are states or yes. in your country. Yes, I, I know many young generation, they use uh, music you know, to express a dancer and also like to let people know about the current situation and also to criticize the government. So a good thing is that we still have some media, you know, uh, some media who base in a foreign country uh, news media. So they, we have free to you know, broadcast those things, even though the government censorship. So they can freely, they might record some music about the current situation and send to those news media. And the news media from the foreign country, they will broadcast in, uh, in Myanmar. So we can still watch and listen uh, many different kinds of musical genres about um, the politics and uh, criticizing about the current situation. So I I believe, you know, people or children, you know, uh, they, they really understand you know, like the music is a way to express you know, about their you know, love, uh, about the collective, about everything. Thank you very much. Oh, and I would just like to add to that. Um, there have been several videos on YouTube from particularly uh, internally displaced uh, kids in uh, camps in various areas of uh, Shan State and Karen State. And the kids are doing hip hop and they're singing in Karen or they're singing in Shan, sometimes in Burmese, but it's all resistance, resistance to the government. And that, that's new for kids to take on as a hip hop topic. Um, and these kids are maybe 10, 12, 11, but they're, they're winning competitions. They're, I mean, this is all cropped up just this year. So it, it, yeah, that, that, that's a fascinating thing to look into. Um, I just wanna speak quickly to school children. So as Nemio said in his talk, there's no, there's no music in elementary schools. There are no music classes. There are no art classes in the government schools. So that's a lot to chew on. Related to that is a follow-up question from uh, Sui Beng. You wanna ask that question, Dr. Tan? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I understand that, that, that music and, and dance are not, teached, are not taught in the schools, but uh, I, 
I mean, they must be doing some kind of performance or, you know, for special occasions in, in normal time. So what kinds of music do they do they perform? I mean, is it rap or popular music only or, or what? Yeah. Um, I think Tuntun is, is, I don't know if Nguyen is still. I think his connection lost. His, we lost him. Yeah, Nemio, maybe you can speak to that. Um, to be honest, you know, when I was young, I, uh, I mean, before I joined Guitar Make in, in 2000, I don't really know that music is something to study, uh, like a school curriculum. It's for us, it's more like you know, a career you do uh, after you finish your high school, something like that. So for my whole life, I mean, for my uh, high school uh, from grade one to grade 12, so I have only studied only two songs. Actually, that two songs, you know, they put one they put one, you know, session, you know, one uh, uh, timetable, you know, for you know, they, they they say it's music for music and for painting. Actually, we do not have music teacher. We do not have you know a painting teacher. So that uh, you know a lot of time uh, is usually for you know, some teacher who miss their class. They will come to that uh, time and they will teach what they you know, miss. Uh, they are absent in classes. So it's like that, you know, like but and you really you know we have some festival, you know, like. You know, let's say like you know, the, angel, the full moon day festival. So the same teachers who are interested in music and dance, they might give some cassette tape, some you know, or music, uh, sometimes traditional, uh, sometimes it's more like propaganda song by the military government. So they will you know, play back and you know, they will teach students you know, to dance uh, like a you know, group uh, dance, something like that. So not really uh, that much you know, music and you know, dance activity you know, uh, I, I think it's also the same for almost you know, the whole uh, country, not just in my hometown. So do you, do you see uh, heritage bearers or traditional musicians uh, starting community type of, of theatre or community groups, you know, to, to, to teach them, to teach the younger generation about the tradition at, at, at the ground level? I think it depends. <laughs> Well, it's an interesting question, um, so because because of different hierarchies in society, right? You have now a lot of young uh, upper middle class Burmese kids going to international schools and learning sort of a, a an imposed you know version of a Burmese song or national anthem or but the musicians themselves on the outside, unless I mean you could if you consider the community of Napoe and the Napoe musicians and and when. The Napoe's happen in various towns. You could say that that's an inspiration for young kids to go in and listen to different traditional musical instruments, right? Um, and that's nothing new. That's been going on for a long time. But because of how uh, society is so it's um, highly structured or highly hierarchical, um, that's not going to be the choice of a middle class family to have their kids go listen to. Mm. So I, yeah, that's that's a hard question to, to, to find the category for, right? For, for that kind of answer that might be found in another country. The church, I must say, and in among like Christian Burmese and Christian, uh, Christian ethnic groups, the Karen, the Kachin, many groups, Chin, um, the church provides that community. Among Buddhists, more in the Buddhist part of, of, of the population, um, it's a different tangent. You know, it's a different relationship. So Gita Met is actually playing a very critical role in the promotion of the traditions, yeah? As um, I see, yeah. Yeah, we hope so. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. It's very yeah. uphill. We have Professor Nguyen Thun back. We, we lost you for a while. I'm sorry. <laughs> we understand. Are there any more questions? We are about to close before we close our session for today. Well, if I may just briefly wrap up this very uh, interesting panel, um, I reminded of a work by Joseph Haydn, which is Musica or Misa in Angusti is Mass in the Time of Turmoil. For indeed, we are living in, in times of turmoil um, for musicians the world over who have lost their, their venues and who have lost um, their gigs. But it's unimaginable for the rest of us about what is happening also in, in Myanmar. Uh, in, uh, on top of the pandemic, you have this uh, political turmoil ongoing. But what the Gitemite has shown us is very encouraging to us all. 
that, that the transmission of music and tradition has to go on um, because the work of healing um, through music and building communities through music needs to go on. We thank you for joining us. We thank you. Uh, we thank our panelists, Kit Yang, Ne Win Toon, uh, Ni, Ni Myung Ong, and uh, our panelists uh, on panel five, Jocelyn Guadalupe, Claire Suet Chin Chan, and Anotai Nitibon. And of course, we thank uh, our keynote speaker for today, Patricia Campbell. Thank you very much. We hope to see you again next week as we uh, listen to papers uh, and lectures on creation. But before we end, let me just acknowledge the following who have made this project possible. We thank uh, the Office of the Chancellor of UP Diliman. Let me just scroll up to read my list here. So we thank Chancellor Fidel Nemenso of the Office of the Chancellor of the UP uh, Diliman. We thank you. The, we thank the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Administration, the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Development, the University of the Philippines Computer Center, and the UP Diliman Information Office. Thank you again for uh, staying tuned and. We hope to see you again for our last installment of APSE 2021. See you next week. Thank you very much. We ask the panelists to stay for our uh, picture taking. Thank you.